Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Science Institute series and lectures that we bring people together to find common ground. We're really excited to have you with us here today. As you know, Science Institute takes a 360 degree view of the policymaking process, bringing people from all different sectors together. We encourage you to get on our social media and join our newsletter to find out about future events with Sign. Today, we're very honored to have Governor Larry Hogan join us for this conversation, and certainly it's timely with everything that's going on. But as a special honor today, he will be introduced by our very own President Sylvia Burwell of American University. As many of you know, she is the 15th president of American University and the first woman to serve in that role. And before that, she was had two cabinet positions, both as Secretary of Health and Human Services and Director of the Office of Management and Budget. She is one of those people who've worked in many sectors to find common ground. So please, President Burwell, we'd love to have you uh, join us and introduce our guest today. Great, Amy, thank you so much um, and for your leadership of the Sign Institute and uh, leading us in the vision that Jeff and Samira Sign created in terms of uh, creating a university-wide place for collaboration and policy innovation. Thanks to the Sign team. Thanks to everyone who's joining us today and a special thanks to our special guest, Governor Hogan. And I, of course, want to start by pointing out that while Maryland does have some claims on Governor Hogan. He was born in the District of Columbia, and he is the husband of an AU alum, so we know that he is really an equal at heart. So um, welcome. Um, the First Lady of Maryland, Yumi Hogan, earned her master's degree uh, in fine arts from AU, so we consider you a bit of an ego, uh, eagle as well. Governor Hogan and I actually started our jobs uh, at the same time, two jobs, when I was Secretary of HHS and you had just become governor, and so had the chance and opportunity to work with the governor um, from the early time when I was at HHS and he was governor, and know that we were able to work and work on issues of common ground, whether that was on the opioid issue issues issues having to do with the border, his great work, and we see his incredible leadership at the National Governors Association, and now that great leadership in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I have know that Governor Hogan pursues this approach to finding common ground, not about making headlines, but about making impact. And I think we all, those of us who live in this region, have been fortunate to be able to be the beneficiaries of that. And the title of his recent book, I think, tells you that finding common ground isn't always the easiest thing to do, um, but it is an incredibly important thing to do, and that finding common ground is often about community, and I certainly have found that here at American University as we've worked through this COVID period of time, whether it's our faculty moving 2,000 classes online in 10 days, our students continuing to engage and lead, and our staff as well. And this concept of community is one that Governor Hogan is also quite familiar with. And when he was starting to run for governor, he turned to an eagle for good advice, and we're glad about that. He turned to his wife, Yumi, and she said, if you are running for governor, you have to hear from the people. And that is something that this governor has certainly done, is hear from the people. And today, we are honored to be able to have the chance to hear from you. Governor Hogan, welcome. And Amy, do I need to turn it back to you for any details before we get started? No, I think we're ready. Well, uh, can I just say thank you so much, President Burwell. Uh, thank you for uh, that wonderful introduction and thank you for the great work you're doing as the president of American University. Amy, um, I'm looking forward to the discussion and I just wanna thank everybody for joining us this afternoon. I, I, I can't, can't thank you enough for inviting me to be with you. We're excited to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you, President Burwell. Thank you for your leadership in these uh, trying times for the university. We appreciate it. Well, Governor, if you need, Proof, I read the book. These are all the things that I wanna ask wow. you. This was incredible. We encouraged everybody to, to read it, but I have to say it was an incredible breakdown of just different parts of your life and how this has influenced your leadership as, as governor. Um, and I definitely think you're the definition of, of public service and especially in these challenging times. So we're so grateful for you to take the time to join us today. If you don't mind, I wanna start by asking you you know, where that public service kind of burgeoned up because, you know, your dad, as certainly a member of Congress, was a member of Congress during one of another one of um, the nation's challenging times during the Nixon impeachment. And 
He was one of the first Republicans in Congress, you know, to call for that. Um, and, you know, he said at one point, we must pledge our highest allegiance to the strength of law and not the common frailties of men. He sounded like an incredible individual. How did he influence your um, pursuit of public service? Well, thank you very much, uh, Amy. I, um, I, I'm very proud of my dad. Um, I, I learned a heck of a lot about uh, integrity and public service from him. And as you point out, he was serving on the House Judiciary Committee during the impeachment of, of President Nixon, and he was the very first Republican to come out for the president's um, impeachment and the only Republican member of Congress to vote for all three articles of impeachment. At the time, it was not a very popular thing with the White House or his colleagues in Congress or with a lot of his supporters and constituents being a, a member of the same party coming out against the, against the sitting president. Uh, but in, in hindsight, it's the thing he's most remembered for mm -hmm. and the thing I'm most proud of. So I'm, I'm you know, I, I certainly learned a heck of a lot from him and and um, proud of the service. And that's where I think that my, my desire for public service comes from that. Although I spent my entire life really in the private sector and governor is the first job that I've held as elective office. But I, uh, I think my dad had a big influence on me. Yeah, I mean, you worked on so many of the campaigns and certainly in some of, um, you know, in his offices. I, I will say one of the interesting, um, we've got so many students from, you know, AU on, one of the interesting experiences you had is that you had an internship when you were at Florida State University with the House Minority Leader there, Tom Lewis. And, you know, as you said, the politics of personal relationships is one of the lessons you learned there. Like, did actually having an internship at the state legislature help you in this role that, that you're in now and understanding those dynamics? Well, look, I'm a big believer in internships and I would encourage any of your students uh, who are thinking about that to, to try to pursue an internship in, in whatever area they think is gonna be helpful to them. And I, I, I can't, you know, I can't say, I was mainly uh, commandeering a, a Xerox machine, I said, and, and delivering <laughs> things and maybe trying to help answer some, some mail or answer the phone. So it wasn't a high level, uh, <laughs> le but I really did learn at least to get to see what it's like to be in a state house. So it's in Tallahassee, Florida, it's Florida State University and, um, and where the state capital is. And so I just got a chance to just watch and observe and, 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 and see that things got done you know, basically by the personal relationships, which is certainly one lesson that I learned. And uh, yeah. I think internships are extremely valuable. Well, and you know, certainly that there's, I'm sure opportunities in your office or others that will work with the Career Center to make sure we have access to for our we students. We would love like to have that. some AU students uh, coming out here and working in the state of Maryland. We, we absolutely will follow up with you. All right, we'll do that. You know, you did mention you have a lot of experience in the private sector and um, you, you did pursue commercial real estate. Um, but do you think that business perspective also was important when you think about the learning, you know, one of the sections of your book is about learning, like being, you know, having that as a career path, did that help influence it? You're having to deal a lot with economic development, the challenges with small businesses right now in the state of Maryland. How did that help you? Well, I think it was very helpful, and I can credit that to my dad for that as well, because although he spent a lot of his life in public service, he encouraged me to participate in the process and to be involved, and I certainly cared about politics and policy, but he said, you know, I think you ought to pursue a career doing something else, and then, you know, maybe come back to public service at some point later, which is exactly what I did. I spent, you know, uh, 30 some years running a small business and learning a heck of a lot and then decided to run for office um, where a lot of people might spend their entire careers in, in, a, in elective office. And, and I, I appreciated that perspective uh, from being in the private sector and knowing something about the public sector it was a good balance for me. Um, I, I was in a business where, um, you know, our success depended on bringing people together uh, to, to reach agreement. And that's been probably the most valuable. I mean, certainly I, I, I'm, I'm very concerned about small businesses that are struggling, about trying to put more people to work, about fixing our economy as we're currently, you know, devastated with the, with the COVID crisis and it's impacted not just our health, but, but the health of our economies. So, the, but the real thing was I spent a whole, my whole life trying to reach agreement and bringing parties that were on opposite ends together mm -hmm. Uh, and that's what I do now. So yeah. I think it's a was a very valuable lesson. I, I spend a lot of my time 
you know, my legislature is 70% uh, Democrats, I'm a Republican. We've found a lot of common ground. And I think that that experience about how to bring people together and to listen and to find that middle ground where everybody could, could reach an agreement, I think has been critically important. You know, Governor, you were very transparent in the book too about the challenges. We were going through another financial challenging time nationally when you when you own this business and in, in some respects kind of losing and having to reveal build your constituents are going through that right now. And one of the interesting things you said that is it definitely made you more empathetic. And I'm really curious like what role you think empathy has as you moved into the public sector and what that taught you going through that financial ch challenge. Well, I think it's, uh, first of all, it was a, you know, I, I went through a very difficult time financially and it did help me to understand um, what it's like for the people to go through it. I mean, you can be in an elective office and you can really care about people and try to solve their problems and you can hear about someone who's lost their job or someone that's lost their, their, their small business or, the, you know, been lost their home in foreclosure. Uh, but to actually have gone through it yourself you have a better understanding of the pain that these individuals are going through and, you know, kind of made me more empathetic about really trying to help those people that needed help in a time of economic turmoil. Do you think people are more receptive for, for you having a conversation with them if you know, if they know you've had some of those experiences too? Yeah. I don't think a lot of people knew a lot uh, you know, I, 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 yeah. I really try to listen and I just was open in this book about, you know, my, the, not, not just the good times and the successes, but uh, I was trying to, you know, say that I actually learned a lot from failures and from disappointments, probably more uh, that have helped me more in the long run. So it was, it was about not letting setbacks uh, get in your way and, and, and also just understanding that what people are going through. Uh, I think it yeah, that's why I think it's such an important book to read for especially our young, younger audience, you know, students that are on today, because you, you did say like the learning, you know, piece from that and how important it is. Um, there was another job that you held um, when you were appointment secretary um, and held that position in the Ehrlich administration, governor's you know, office in Maryland. Now you weren't photocopying by then, right? I mean, you'd moved on, you were doing a little bit more in that job, okay? But, <laughs> I, had, um, I moved you, up from there, yeah. Yes, yes, they expect a little bit, a little bit more, but you know, it literally taught you everything about state government. So having that role, like you, you say in the book, like this was a piece that helped you because it's a lot of moving pieces doing this, yeah, correct? Yeah. Well, so yeah, I, I, so I, even though I spent almost my entire career in, in business, mm -hmm. I did take a stint away from my business for four years to serve as a cabinet secretary for a, a guy named Bob Ehrlich, a former governor of Maryland. He and I are the only two Republicans in 50 years to be elected in Maryland. Um, but I, I, so it, I was in a position that almost nobody ever heard of, which was called the Secretary of Appointments, but it was all the uh, appointment powers of the governor. There are some appointing judges and other cabinet secretaries and people to, you know, the Board of Regents and numerous commissions and authorities and boards and positions. So I, I, I got to touch on almost every agency of state government yeah. and recruit people, you know, 7,000 some people into the state government and go through interviews and selections. And it, it just gave me a better understanding of state government as somebody who had never worked in state government before. Right, well, you know where they all the offices are, as, who the talent is. Yeah, yeah a lot of times sure. a business person comes in and doesn't have a clue. Um, yeah. I had a little bit of a primer on, you know, the basics of what was happening in state government, more so than just running the photocopier. <laughs> <laughs> As we say, it evolves, it evolves. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting because you also ran a, a nonprofit in Change Maryland, where we also say, you know, the Sign Institute, you can influence, you know, the process in a lot of ways. And I think with Change Maryland, you were trying to influence from the outside to say, like, what's going right? You know, what's going wrong? And how do we how do we do this? And, yeah. and from that platform, you decide to enter the governor's race. So they say sometimes races find you, you find races. Like, how did that come about? Here you are it's, running Change Maryland, and then suddenly you say, well, wait a minute, who's yeah. going to make the change? And it's you. So well, yeah, that w really was not the plan. I know it sounds like <laughs> it was all contrived, but I, I was serving on a, on the board of directors of a, of a group called Maryland Public Policy Institute. And we were putting out some really great work with some smart people, you know, papers about uh, why we were suffering economically and how, mm -hmm. how we could turn the economy around. How could we be more competitive with other states? And it was good stuff, but very few people were ever reading the policy papers. But many of the folks listening today hopefully do and they're interested in policy, but the average voter really didn't. And 
So I started this group called Change Maryland to kind of boil these messages down to, uh, to, to a, something that the average person might listen to. And right, uh, right. Change Maryland was the, it became the largest, I just started it by myself and a couple of friends, and, mm -hmm. but it became the largest nonpartisan grassroots citizen organization in state history. And we had just as many Democrats as Republicans and independents involved in this group. And we were really trying to change some of the policies mm -hmm. that we saw that needed to be changed. Our state had was 49th out of 50 states in overall economic performance. And we were That's losing businesses and jobs and taxpayers were fleeing the state. And I really cared about it. And so that's why I got involved. And I was thinking, you know, we can't really change Maryland after several years of this. Uh, we can't change Maryland without changing the people that, you know, are in control of what's right. going on. And maybe we should find someone to run for governor. And I couldn't find anybody in Maryland because it was impossible for a Republican to win in Maryland. So I did, I was the only one crazy enough to try to do it myself. Well, and you, you had run difficult races before where you took on strong, you know, Democratic yeah. challengers uh, running against Congressman Hoyer as well. So you and weren't Congressman fearful Hoyer and of trying our friends to- And we get along yeah. well, but we have a little bit of a history. I was this young, brash, you know, 30 something year old kid running against the leader of Congress. And, uh, and uh, we gave him a run for his money, but uh, you know, so we close, just- yeah disagreed on some of the issues and we ran a no money and a grassroots effort. And so I learned a little bit about that. And then I waited um, 22 years uh, before I decided to run for anything end. else. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it was interesting because one of the things that I found really interesting as a campaign operative myself, seeing how you yeah. ran that race, um, it was against, you know, a Lieutenant governor, um, you know, and, and trying to run against that administration is what you did, but you, you, you really stayed positive during the entire campaign. And so I'm curious why there was that commitment to do that when, you know, some people would have probably and tried to push, probably tried to push you a little bit to say you could go negative against this sitting administration where some of those statistics were not maybe representative of where the, the state wanted to go. Well, people were, people were frustrated with where the state was. And I wanted to, I raised some of the issues on things that I thought we needed to change, but I was very careful not to you know, make it kind of a, the personal attacks that we see in politics today, really from both sides. And it's one of the things that frustrates me the most. And so I was outspent almost 10 to one in that race. I ran on public financing, was the first, first and only person to ever be elected in our state with that. We spent $2.4 million in the entire campaign against 20 some million dollars by my basically incumbent opponent. Um, but I, people responded to the message and the things that we were talking about. And I worked really hard. We had a great grassroots bipartisan effort with Democrats and independents who really wanted change also. It was not a Republican Democrat thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and I just tr tried to stay above the fray as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And people responded well to that. You know, my opponent, who's a smart guy and he's in Congress now, he, he, he ran, and I don't think it was his, his decision, but some of his campaign advisors, he just had a scorched earth attack, uh, you know, commercials attacking me as this unknown challenger. And uh, it backfired. It, it was yeah. people liked our positive message better. And uh, I, I think that's still true today. I'm very frustrated with the kind of the divisive and angry politics. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting. I'm very interested to hear your take on this. Your campaign, like you said, was very grassroots. You were going to all the county fairs. You were going to all the, I mean, I'm sure you ate, cracked more crabs and like, yeah. you know, went around the state, which that I would have gone with you in a heartbeat, you know, but hey, in this current time, you're not running this year, but what would it have been like running this year when we're having to virtually campaign? Because your tactic was really getting, meeting with people, like, what are the challenges in this environment, you know, to try and do that grassroots work? I think it's really challenging and difficult. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that, uh, you know, people are really trying to navigate through that and figure that out. Mm -hmm. I am, you know, I happen to be a real people person and I love meeting people and shaking hands. And, and, you know, I'm, you know, Joe Biden is kind of like that, put an arm around somebody, give yeah, somebody a hug, yeah. you know, it's, and not seeing anyone and not going to events and not being able to meet thousands of people. 
and just talking like we are, you know, on on a on a Zoom chat or whatever, yeah. uh, it it, it miss it loses something, and so you really got to rethink how you do the campaigns, and it's uh, it's an interesting. We I don't think we've ever, nobody's ever had to deal with this before. No, it's, I'm glad it's I didn't because I would not have won in 2014 or 18 if I didn't get a chance to go out and meet hundreds of thousands of people face to face. Yeah, well, wasn't there like a bus or a van you took all around, like you know, and literally went county by county. Yeah, we, mm -hmm. we couldn't afford much, but I got an old RV and, and you know, <laughs> wrapped it with stuff and we called it the bus, but it really wasn't much of a bus. It rattled, and, you know, uh, but we took it everywhere and, and put a ton of miles on it. And I just went to everywhere I could find people, you know, we couldn't, yeah. we couldn't afford much television. Uh, so I was like, we're going to every crab feast, every bull roast, every county fair, and I'm going to go talk to people directly. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's interesting because this is a hard fought campaign and, and you're in a state where you really did have to bring people together because this is not one where you can just turn out one side Republican votes or Democratic votes. You really had to, to find, you know, no, um, when support I, in, in all different places. In 2014, when I was elected, Maryland had the highest percentage of Democratic registrants of any state in America. There, and uh, where they're only 26% Republican in the state. So, uh, you know, I, I obviously had to get a big chunk of Democrats and independents to consider voting for me. And many people said, I've never voted for a Republican before in my life, uh, and I, but I'm voting for you. And that's what they did. And then in 2018, which was a really big blue year, um, yeah. you know, I won a, pretty, a landslide reelection in, in a state that is more than you know, two and a half to one Democrat to Republican. And, and what a challenge, because you're no longer running as that outside challenger who is questioning totally where's the direction. You own decisions that were made you know, by the state. So as an incumbent, that must have been having to adjust your campaign to talk about that. You know, so. Well, and it was a very difficult environment because um, the, the, the president uh, you know, lost our state by 29 points. Uh, I think more than any other state in the country, Hillary Clinton won in a landslide. And there were a lot of people, I think Trump's approval rating was below 30% when I was running for reelection as a sitting president. And a lot of people were trying to blame uh, me as this kind of independent thinking, bipartisan guy working across the aisle for things that were happening in Washington just because I had the same letter after my name. And yeah. uh, so we had yeah. to separate the job we had done and the successes we had made and let people know that I was not Donald Trump and that it, it really wouldn't be fair to punish me for, for if you're angry about what's going on in Washington. Right, and really run on the record as a governor right. and in your state. Well, right. I have to say, I'm not going to give away everything in the book because everybody has to buy it. Well, we want read, somebody to go actually read the book besides you. Yes, we do. We need more people to get it. But I, I will say one of the neatest stories I thought is when you finally realized you were the governor-elect of Maryland, because it's not like there was this big announcement. Like you said, what happened? Like, was it suddenly a recognition because... Who walked yeah. in the room? It, it's it was really a surreal moment because yeah. because it was not supposed to happen. I mean, our our race was not on the radar screen. We had no money. My name was never mentioned in any national media. Nobody expected. You know, they there's different states that are we know are going to be Democrats. Maryland was one of them. Yeah. Uh, there's competitive states that are swing states, and then Maryland was like on the no way is this ever going to happen. So nobody paid attention. And all of a sudden, it looked like we might win. But my opponent had not conceded. And, mm -hmm. uh, and they, none of the networks, uh, you know, the Associated Press and none of the networks were calling the race. But we knew that the numbers were looking great. And the way I found out was state troopers knocked on the suite of our hotel room and said, Governor, we're here to protect you. So that they had seen even- They made the I announcement. Kept, I was ready to go make a victory speech. And my, my, uh, my political you know, team was like, you can't go down and just say I won. Somebody has to say you won. And the way I found out was the troopers knocking on the door, which was- It was the troopers. And, and you've, on the other line, you've got um, Governor Christie, who's then yeah. running the Republican governor's- yeah. Association saying go go go, you know there was a big win. Christie for him. was, was calling me. Yeah. You know, they had won. Christie was the chair of the Republican Governors Association. They had won. Th there were thirty six Republican governors at that time. That that night was a huge win for him. They picked up I don't know ten additional seats, and but Maryland wasn't supposed to be one of them. And Christie was so excited when he saw that we. He kept calling me saying. Are you really? Are you really going to win? Or is this really? Are the number? I was like, yeah, we we we're, we're, we're going to win, uh, but we couldn't get the official. So he was he was kind of more excited than I was because he wanted to take some credit for pulling off the impossible. Sure, here. sure, and supporting. Well, you know, I think it's really important for people um, in this conversation to know that you know 
campaigning's over. You know, you want to celebrate this, but governing begins. Like, it's important for people to understand that transition and what it's like to go from candidate to elected official. I think it's faster than some people realize. Yeah. And what has to get done now you you know certainly built like you said the staffing with governor Ehrlich, but suddenly you're the governor and it's fast and you're expected to do a budget right away correct i mean yeah well so it's it was it's really fast that's one thing people don't realize you have the election and then a couple months later you get sworn in we didn't have any transition funds we didn't the, we don't have any transition team it's just basically volunteers who are working on this and we had to put together uh, a, a, a $43 billion budget with nobody working in government. We had only had uh, four years in the past 50 years where there were any Republicans anywhere in state government. So I, I put together a bipartisan cabinet, half Democrats, half Republicans. I just found the best possible people I could find. And we worked around the clock. And But we uh, we submitted the first balanced budget in a decade, uh, you know, the, on, on the day that, you know, I, I, I got sworn in, the night after my... Uh, my inaugural celebration or the day after. Yeah. Yeah. It goes, it goes really fast. And I think it's really important. I want to share, um, I'm going to read it directly. Um, you had a litmus test for every bill or action and, and I quote, you said, will this action make it easier for families and businesses to stay and prosper in Maryland? Will it make more families and more businesses want to come to Maryland and help us grow our economy? How important was it to have a filter, because I'm sure once you win the election too, there's a lot of expectations. Everybody wants you to work on and do things, you know, sure. um, of interest to them. So yeah, well, thank you for pulling that quote out because it really yeah. was. It was a simple thing, and there were a lot more to our plans and what we were going to accomplish. Mm -hmm. But that was really why I ran. And you know, I was a small businessman who was really frustrated that we had lost uh, more than 10,000 businesses and 100,000 jobs and. The, uh, we, a Gallup poll came out that said 47% of all the people in Maryland wanted to leave the state. And, and that just broke my heart as yeah, a lifelong that's... Marylander. So that's what I was focused on. Everything I was doing, I was thinking about the average person, you know, we need to get people to stay in Maryland, but not, right. not flee the state. We need businesses to stay and we want to attract them. And so uh, as I was going through almost any decision, I was like, how's this impact the average hardworking Maryland family? Or how does this impact those struggling small business owners? And how can we get more people to stay in the state and be productive and turn our economy around? And you know, as a result, we went from 49th out of 50 states in overall economic performance to the top 10. We had the biggest economic turnaround in America. Yeah, I think it was so important that you had that right from the beginning because it helped to center the work and, and do that. And yeah. listen, to me, you know, especially when you see what, what the state's been going through this year, you seem unflappable on that, you know, with your leadership. But I, I will, I have to ask, because it was one of my favorite parts of the book, inauguration, your teleprompter cuts out. Yeah. Okay. Was yeah, that so, like the most like, uh, you know, it, moment it, for you or? Let me tell you something. I, w I had never used a teleprompter <laughs> before in my life. I had no, I didn't know anything about teleprompters. And for my big inaugural speech, I mean, there's a couple thousand people out yeah. the, on the steps of the Capitol. And um, I, I, I start to get, I get to my, maybe about a quarter of the way through the speech <laughs> and the, these two screens just turn dark. Yeah. And, and I was like frozen for a second. Like, what do I do? I kind of remembered the next line because I'd been through the speech a few times, but I, I didn't know where to go from there. And then I saw a flicker and one screen came on. The other, you know, you normally you look back and forth as you're reading. I had to land the plane with, with one engine, <laughs> you know, but I don't, not, I don't think anybody noticed. Um, but, I don't but, think so either. So I was so impressed that you shared that because everybody said it was such a great speech and it was, you know, your first real, you know, as this public servant. And I think, you know, again, I think, you know, it's a good test of how unflappable you started to be with, you know, with uh, all yeah. the challenges that you've You know, the sequel and, was last year, I gave my state of the state uh, address mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, I'm in this, in the house chamber and it's a big deal and it's on live television and the teleprompters never came on. So luckily I had a written version, but it was so. Something with you said, and oh, teleprompters, I think. Teleprompters Governor. don't I ever, know. there's never a problem. Well, it happened twice I had a problem. <laughs> it, well, okay. So I, here you are, like you said, like in the state of the state, you also have the, the you know, state legislature in front of you as your, as your audience for part of this. I'm really, you know, you talk about building consensus and doing that. State legislature, traditionally very D, you know, majority like what was your relationship and what has your relationship been with the the legislature over the course of time and 
did you feel you needed them to execute everything you wanted to do? Did you want them to be a partner in that or? No, no, no. So I, I you know, I set the tone for this. The, the Democrats have been in control of Maryland for decades and it's near, it was nearly a monopoly with the one small exception for a four year period to had a Republican governor who did not win reelection. Uh, but more than 70% of our House and Senate are, you know, pretty progressive Democrats, far, far left. And I'm a right of center, uh, you know, moderate Republican. Um, so we disagree on issues. Um, but when I ran, I built this coalition of Democrats and independents and Republicans. And my first inaugural, I talked, I, the whole focus of it was on bipartisanship. And that this did not, I did not want it to be the start of a, era of divided government, but a new opportunity for us to, you know, find that common ground where we can all stand together. And then I was going to, John F. Kennedy, you know, talked about not, not, not taking Republican ideas or Democratic Democrat ideas, ideas, but the right ideas. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I, I quoted him and I talked about, let's just find solutions to these problems in a bipartisan way. And um, we've had our di disagreements and I, uh, many of the things I would like to get done did not get passed through the legislature. There are many things they wanted to do that didn't happen. But on a number of big issues, we really did come together. And, yeah. and, I, and, and I, you know, I, we don't, we're not in sync on every issue, but right. we know that these are the problems. And I try to listen to the other side and see if we can't find a way uh, to not just go with the Republican doctrine or the Democratic, but say, let, how do we solve this problem together? And, right. and it's really worked. And I think that's why the voters rewarded me with, with uh, you know, sending me back for another four years. And it, it turns out both Democrats and Republican voters really like pragmatic politicians that are willing to focus on and solve the serious problems right. without the divisive rhetoric and the, and the spin. And, you know, it's very popular. You know? Yeah. And honesty and transparency that, that you adhere to, like it, it will benefit you, you know, yeah. certainly throughout um, your term. I yeah. will say that you have this, you know, litmus test, you're ready to go. And one of the first things that happened is something that really ripped Baltimore specifically apart, the Freddie Gray incident that um, many people are aware of. It was very early in your administration. Yeah. How did that teach you as the role of governor and like, you know, kind of, having to address an issue that was really dividing a community like that? Well, it was, uh, I, w I had only been governor for 89 days when yeah. the worst violence in 47 years broke out in our largest city of Baltimore after the tragic death of Freddie Gray. And this was af right after Ferguson at the early stages of the Black Lives Matter movement. And we were seeing some of this now with, with the murder of George Floyd and all the things across the country. But this was, you know, almost six years ago, five and a half years ago, when we kind of saw some of these things early. And so as a brand new governor who was, our team was just getting up to speed. We were just through our first legislative session, trying to push some of our agenda and work with the democratic legislature, violence erupted. And in the first few hours, we had 400 some businesses and homes destroyed and you know, 127 police and firefighters were injured and hospitalized and the city was crying out for help. So we, I had to declare a state of emergency, bring in a more uh, a police to back up the beleaguered Baltimore city police and some national guard. But I also went directly to Baltimore and I walked the streets for a week and met with leaders in the community and with the NAACP and with faith-based leaders. And I walked the streets and I hugged people whose homes were burned out. And and I, it, it was, you know, I had to be the guys trying to stop the violence and keep the peaceful protesters safe and keep the citizens in the, in the neighborhoods safe. But I also had to kind of be the consoler in chief. And, and, and also I worked very hard to try to find some consensus and lower the temperature. Yeah. And I think those are lessons that, you know, we, we, we really could look to today for some of the things that we're seeing um, for only same kinds of issues. Same in, kinds of across issues. Across America. Is really you dealt with right early in your administration. And I know your constituents were thrilled. I'm sure your secret, the, the, the service detail was not thrilled, let's be honest, that you are, you know, suddenly playing basketball with community members and talking to them. But I think it's the difference sometimes, and we talk about it a lot at Sign. You can listen, but are you actually hearing people, right? And so that, that you know, being able to figure out and going right where this is happening to figure out what are these problems and how are we yeah. going to address them. Um, and in an interesting way, you were also very transparent that like, here you were 89 days in, you were supposed to make rapid fire decisions. 
with people you admit, military people who you say, they have more experience than I do, you know, in this, but that leadership, the decision was yours, you know, the buck you said, stop yeah. there. But how important is it to, like, when do you make decisions and when do you lean on the expertise around you? You know, that's, so I try to surround myself with the very best people. And mm -hmm. I try to really listen to the experts and their advice, which is something I've been doing in this most recent COVID situation as well with our yes. doctors and public health officials and scientists. Uh, but, but, you know, I listen to the input from everybody, but I had to make the, 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 the quick decisions because our city was on fire. You know, people were, were being hurt and the you know, being a, it, hesitation would not have been good. So I, I tried to forget about the politics of it and just do what I thought was right based on the best information I could find. And, uh, and thinking again about those average, the average citizen in Baltimore, what, what, what did they need? And they were crying out for help and, and they appreciated our efforts there, but it was, it was making those decisions. There were a lot of them. I was a brand new commander in chief sort of, of all these, right. uh, both right. military and police and fire and all the other support services. Uh, but I also you mentioned, you know, I went to Freddie Gray's neighborhood uh, the very next day after the smoke was still clearing in West Baltimore. And I, I walked through his neighborhood and, 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 and hung out with some young uh, men that were shooting baskets out there. And I, I did say I got some street cred because uh, they couldn't <laughs> believe I could shoot a basketball at my age. Like you say, I think you say in the book too, like as you're walking away, you actually hear these young individuals say like, do we just play basketball with the governor of the state? You know, I mean, it was like unbelievable. But I think trying to break down that separation is, is really important. Yeah. Well, no, I think just listening and then, you know, following up. We haven't solved the problems of Baltimore and we haven't, you know, we still have the same kinds of issues in, in our cities across the country that have to be addressed. And we still have to address many of these same concerns about you know, injustice and, and uh, issues haven't gone away. But we have tried hard to listen and take steps that would improve, like record funding education and doing redevelopment in some of these neighborhoods and, and job training and you know, just investing more in those neighborhoods. And yeah. I think we're making progress, but we still have a long way to go. Right. And I, and I don't think we'd wish it on you, but 89 days in, having been faced with that crisis, it really helped you to bring a team together to face other challenges, especially when we think about recent challenges with COVID and the financial crisis. Well, it, it showed me that I was, I made really good decisions in bringing together a great team because uh, although we were fairly new on the job, we got tremendous credit. Uh, you know, they, they don't teach a, a course at, at the NGA baby governor school about what to yeah. do when your largest city is on fire. Uh, but we, I do now teach a course on what to do uh, when something like that erupts. And, and I, I, we just had a really terrific team. Uh, we, we had an African-American female adjutant general of the National Guard, General Linda Singh, who became a, you know, a, 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 just a superstar throughout that. But all of our folks worked really hard and it was kind of baptism by fire for this new, for this new uh, governor that we, you know, we, could we handle a crisis and we did right away. Yeah. And Governor, you were very honest also, there, you faced a personal crisis as well with, with your health. And I think um, when you were on a trip overseas, you found something regular, went to your doctors and literally within 24 hours got a diagnosis that seemed very concerning that it, it, it was, you know, certainly a serious um, cancer situation that, that you had to deal with. You, you know, First of all, can we ask, how are you feeling today? You look phenomenal. Yo, thank you. I, uh, I feel great. I'm, you know, 100% cancer free. And uh, other than needing to lose some pounds, uh, you know, my health is pretty good. <laughs> you, look, you look fantastic. And we're so happy. I know you, your family, your constituents are grateful for that too. Um, you. But, you know, I do think that one of the things that I recognize from that is you were very open with the public and the press. And you went to your team and said, I cannot pretend this isn't happening, I cannot hide this, like they have to know that I'm dealing with this, that I'm still committed to serve every day. But that was challenging. When I read what you went through to try and do both, again, your team was around you, but um, you know, I, th I think- Yeah, well, thank you uh, for, 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 for that. And um, I, it really, you know, so we had these great plans about what we were gonna accomplish. We had our first legislative session, we had some big wins, we were starting to find our way around. Then the riots hit right after that. And then 60 days later, I get hit with this personal crisis I wasn't expecting yeah. from out of the blue, um, a, a, where I had advanced and aggressive cancer all over my body, which I didn't know about. Um, and it was, it was pretty, a pretty scary diagnosis. 
Um, but, you know, I, my first thought was my family, my wife and my daughters, and how am I going to tell them? And, and then I told my immediate staff and my cabinet, and I said, I have to tell the people of Maryland, the, the six million people that put their, just recently put their confidence in me, that they're, the guy they, they voted to, uh, to, 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 to do all these things for them is, is going to be, you know, in kind of a shaky situation. So I, I thought it was important just to be as transparent as possible, and I got some advice not to be quite as transparent, but I immediately just went out, went out and told people exactly what I was facing, just like I explained it to my family and my, you know, my lieutenant governor and my cabinet, my inner circle. I, I just told the public, and I think it helped. Um, I know a lot of people have said to me they went and got checked and yeah, caught cancer can, because of my very visible battle. And so, if I can help anybody. And it was well worth it, but it was it was a challenge. I met so many incredible people that were going through more difficult battles than I was. But I was going to say, what what did it mean to you for the Shelley Jones Wilsons and the Jimmy Merricks and the yeah. Andrew um, Overly? Overall, I think is his name. Like these are people that became like family to you, right? Yeah, I, I, other people that were you know I was in the hospital. I was doing twenty four hour day chemotherapy, and I was in there for days on end. And uh, I, I was tired of sitting in the bed, so I would do laps and I would meet all my fellow patients. And I even went down to the pediatric oncology ward to meet the kids. And, but but yeah, Shelly was just an incredible one from West Baltimore, kind of right where the riots yeah. were, um, who was, you know, had lost all of her hair and she was doing laps and we kind of became lap buddies. Um, you know, joking back and forth. And, yeah. and, and she really was an inspiration. She told me, you're going to lose your hair too, Governor. I had a full head of, you know, white <laughs> hair. And, and I said, bald is beautiful, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to her. Um, but, um, you know, she was an inspiration. Uh, sadly, she did not have the same success I did. And we lost uh, Shelly. And then Jimmy Myrick Jr. was this young man with Down syndrome who was going through le leukemia battle. And, and uh, we became kind of buddies. He was a very positive person. I mean, uh, he really changed my life with his, his smile and his positive attitude. He was very involved in Special Olympics, and um, and and we lost him as well. The, the positive story is Andrew Oberly, who's a little was a five year old, and and uh, he's now ten, <laughs> uh, yeah. but he he beat cancer, and uh, I got to you know be with him, and he he rang the bell and. You know, we hugged each other when I was cancer free. He came to my press conference. I didn't know it. And he came running up to me at the podium and kind of hugged me. And, but we were, we became pen pals writing back and forth. And since yeah. then I've reached out to every time I hear a story about somebody with cancer, I'll pick up the phone and call them or send them a note. And, and I'm very involved in trying to raise money and raise awareness. And so we can find a cure for some of these terrible diseases. Yeah, well, Hogan Strong meant something, seriously. And, and to be able to share that with the community going forward, I think is amazing. Yeah, thank you. I, Governor, I could go on and on. We'll, we'll, you know, obviously, because, you know, but there's so many questions coming in. If you don't mind, yeah. I'm going to take the questions. And then I really do want you to also respond a little bit about, talk about governing during the time of COVID. Yeah. And you're making decisions real time, you know, for the community. Why don't you give us just a little reflection on what this has been like and certainly making decisions that are for the state, but then having to work with county municipal yes. officials. Too. Well, this has been, you know, we talked about some challenging times, but this has been the most challenging time. And hopefully all those other experiences help, help prepare me for this. But, um, you know, not only was I leading my own state, but I was leading the nation's governors as chairman of the National Governors Association yes. and, and trying to, you know, all, the governors are on the front lines of this pandemic, trying to deal with this crisis. And, in some cases, I had to be the one getting my colleagues together to push back when we thought the administration wasn't doing something. I had to try to, you know, sh people were sharing best practices. We were talking in groups. I, I led 50 some calls with the, with all the nation's governors, which hadn't happened in the past 30 years, probably. Yeah. We did it over a five month period. Um, and um, we, we, 30 some of them were with either the vice president or the president, the coronavirus task force, the cabinet. But we also had constant uh, interaction back and forth with governors on both sides of the aisle sharing what's going on in your state how are you dealing with this and uh, I, I'm really proud of the job that the governors have done both Democratic and Republican governors across America who stepped up and I'm really proud of, of, of the, the leadership at NGA and how we were able to get governors working together on the front lines yeah and I'm really impressed too you know governor in, in, in an interesting way 
you, Governor Cuomo, you're looking at things regionally too. This is not just about my state, my borders, but it's like, you know, for us here at American University, obviously what's happening in DC and Maryland yes. and Virginia affect us all. And so your regional concept has really been important to making strong well, decisions. I think many of the governors have done that in areas where, there, you know, the virus doesn't recognize the state borders. Um, and it doesn't recognize blue states and red states. Mm -hmm. And um, so we've been really working closely with the mayor of the District of Columbia, with the governor of Commonwealth of Virginia on a regional basis, some, with, with some, sometimes with Delaware or Pennsylvania on different issues. And then, you know, I put together just recently a 10 state compact with five Republicans and five Democratic governors across the country on rapid testing when we didn't see the federal government stepping up. And, yes, this is a new initiative you're working on, correct? A new initiative just yeah. from last week. But other governor, Governor Cuomo, who, who followed me, he just became the chairman of NGA. He was my vice chairman. Yeah. He's now the chair. But he did a similar kind of thing in New England. And, um, you know, I know some Western governors, um, Governor Newsom and others got together to talk about, you know, similar issues with the state of Washington and others, Oregon. Um, and so it, it definitely was, I think the governors were leading and more involved in this crisis than almost anything I can remember in my lifetime. Okay. Governor, we do have a, a question from our audience, which I think is important from, from uh, Sarah. She's asking like, you're making decisions for the state, but when do you decide, do you supersede a county or a city? Like, you know, how do you work together? It, because there are just, when you think about education and going back to school, there's definitely issues that yes. those orders internally make. Well, Sarah's know. got an excellent question. That's one of the toughest things to navigate yeah. through. So in addition to dealing with the governors, we're also trying to deal with the local leaders, both the the county executives or county commissioners and the, the local county school boards. And uh, so we set statewide parameters. And, and by the way, in our state, you know, we've done a pretty good job. We're, our virus numbers are great. Our economic numbers are great. We're doing better than I think, you know, at least 35 states across the country. Our positivity is around 3% mm -hmm. um, and it has been for three straight months. Um, we made some tough decisions early, but the, the county government, the way the law works in our state at least, mm -hmm. The counties have home rule and they have the ability to make decisions that are more restrictive and they have the ability to make decisions for their local jurisdiction. So we have flexibility, uh, certain more rural, smaller counties may be different than our urban counties of Prince George's and Montgomery County or Baltimore City. So mm -hmm. we set parameters. They can't be less restrictive than the state, but they can be more restrictive. Okay. And they can't open things up faster, but they can move slower. Um, and with respect to school boards, they have the authority. They're elected school boards, in some cases appointed, but duly authorized school boards to make decisions about schools. We set metrics and guidelines from the State Board of Education, which is also autonomous, State Superintendent of Schools, State Board of Ed, um, and from the state health department that, to give guidance, um, but where the school individual counties and the county school boards have the ability to make those those decisions for themselves. Yes, it's important. Talk about coordination, right? Yeah. Um, and in that respect, um, a gentleman, uh, Michael, is asking like, his question is, when the vaccine is available, how are you going to make it consistently and widely available to Marylanders? Because I think access is a big question for people, especially when it comes to, you know, economic justice, you know, social justice. Like, how are we yes. going to make sure people have access to these things? Well, you have some really smart participants today with great questions. So that, that really <laughs> is uh, going to be a very difficult uh, situation. First of all, on the vaccine, we're hopeful uh, you know, we have 40 different companies and or universities in Maryland that are working in one way or another with, with working on uh, potential vaccines. And there are people all around the country and around the world that are doing similar kinds of things. And I, it's encouraging that they seem to be making progress. I don't think we're going to have vaccines available until, you know, early next year. And even then, I don't think they'll be ramped up in full production. So this is going to be a difficult issue. So we've put uh, much of our emphasis uh, with testing and contact tracing and PPE and all that into our communities that are struggling the most, which includes Prince George's County, Baltimore City, and we can address those issues. We're spreading, helping every county everywhere, but particularly the ones that are most impacted. But when it comes to this vaccine, which is so critical to any of us getting back to some semblance of a normal life, um, we're going to have to get the vi vaccine in wide production. And it's, it's an issue we're just starting to have discussions about what happens when we only have 100,000 vaccines for 6 million people. 
How right. do you make those determinations? And the discussions are sort of like, well, healthcare professionals are the most impacted, you know, far more than anybody else because they're coming in contact. Um, you know, so we have to protect them. Is it, do you say, well, if, if we have kids going back to school, do you protect teachers and, you know, or, uh, first responders that are, you know, taking people to hospitals? How do you determine, you know, who has to get them first? Because we're not going to have a full supply for every resident in America for a long time. Very true, very true. Um, I, I do have a question. This is near and dear to my heart too, so I'm glad that Norman asked this. Do you see mail-in balloting working out in Maryland? And how concerned are you as governor with making sure that the voting system works in, in Maryland um, this fall? So I'm concerned, but I, I feel relatively confident. I was, we had some issues and glitches in our primary and our state board of elections is completely autonomous. And they have, again, like the local governments, they have some authority, just like our schools are separate. So I don't have, rightly so, I, I don't have control over the election mechanisms, but we've been pushing to try to make sure that in Maryland, we have access to, uh, we're, we're encouraging vote by mail, We've mailed out ballot applications to everybody in the entire, every voter in the state. I think we're one of only seven or eight states in the country that have done that. Um, we also have early voting and we're encouraging the people who don't vote by mail that want to vote in person that they go by early, eight days of early voting. So we're trying to not have crowds uh, at the polls. And if you, have, if you vote on election day, we're going to have polling places open, protective equipment for everybody, distance and safety measures. But we're encouraging people if they do that to, to, to go at off peak times. I, I'm, I'm somewhat concerned about the heavy volume, how we're going to tabulate all these results but we're, we're working very hard on protecting the vote, making sure it's safe, making sure that uh, we encourage people to, to uh, exercise their vote and get everybody voting, no matter how they choose to do so. And we're trying to keep them safe and keep our, our election judges and everybody else safe as well. Yes. Uh, well, we've I think recruited the, you know, people to help the state board. We got state employees and students from our university system that are willing to serve as election judges. And we're helping provide uh, the protective equipment, and we're we're trying to work with the state board and the local boards of of elections to uh, ensure a safe uh, and fair process. Well, I so appreciate that, Governor. That that you're trying to keep everybody safe, have a just system. But, but it sounds like you are encouraging everybody to vote because it's important. Certainly, well, we want everybody to vote, and uh, you know, we want to, wh whatever way they feel. You know, we're going to give them the options, but we're encouraging people to make sure that they vote. This one's from one of our students, Tyler. He said, knowing your history of bipartisanship, what advice do you have for America today, knowing how divided our country is, which is a conversation we have a lot about, you know, the division. Well, is that Tyler? I think, uh, is that what you said? Yes, Tyler. Yeah. Tyler, good question. That's why you should buy my book. <laughs> because it's about <laughs> how to survive the toxic politics that exactly. divide America. Um, and I do talk about this a lot. It, it, it's very hard. I, I think, you know, it's one of the hardest things we have to figure out a solution to. Um, it takes a lot of us and it takes us on both sides of the aisle trying to fix the broken politics. And I think it's possible because we have done that here in the state of Maryland. And but it's it's gonna it's gonna take everybody on board. I mean, we're I, I I'm disgusted with the politics today, and I think our system is broken. And I I hate the angry and divisive rhetoric, and I hate all the anger and on both sides that are you know the name calling. And I, I we need a more civil discussion in politics. We need more bipartisanship. We need people to say let's let's lower the temperature like I did walking the streets of Baltimore, and and let's figure out what direction we want America to head. People can be passionate about how they feel about issues without demonizing the other side. Um, you know, sometimes people today, it seems like they're more interested in winning arguments than actually coming up with solutions. I'm, I'm a much more pragmatic, let's try to fix things and, and, and stop calling each other names and, and attacking each other. You know, um, Governor, you definitely, while you were in college, when you were young, you got involved in, in you know, yeah. the Republican Party as a young person. I want to give a quick shout out to Katie and Noah, who are in the leadership of our college Republicans here on yeah. campus. Katie, thank you. They submitted some questions from, from the group. But one thing is really like, what do you see as the future for the Republican Party? I remember reading in your book, as a Reagan Republican, like, and being a delegate, like, really trying to organize, you saw his way to try and bring people together as, what do you see, yeah. you know, for the future of the Republican Party? 
Well, I hope that we'll see uh, a return to a more traditional Republican Party and uh, espousing some of the things that I've been talking about today. And I know it's, it's kind of a, a tall order, but I, I really think that after the November election, regardless of what happens and what the result is, I believe that the, my party is going to sit down and re-examine itself about where we head over the next four years. And, and, um, and I think the Democratic Party may do some soul searching as well to figure out, you know, they've got some divisions and, and, and things back and forth too. And what are they going to stand for? What are the two parties going to stand for? But yeah, so Reagan, what I liked about him was he had a kind of a, a positive, hopeful vision. You could disagree with policies and, you know, if you're on what side of the aisle you're on, but he, he, he was a positive, hopeful guy who, the way he talked, the way he spoke, he was very respectful of the office of the presidency. And, and he was a guy who was willing to work in a bipartisan way. He had this great relationship with Tip O'Neill, the Democratic Speaker of the House. Um, and they would disagree passionately, but they would, they would find ways to reach consensus. And uh, I, I think the Republican Party is, is going to, I hope, um, move more to, towards a bigger tent party, uh, where we're not alienating more and more uh, you know, parts of the electorate. You know, that's what I've done in Maryland. It's why I have won overwhelmingly suburban women. It's why I have a, almost a 70% approval rating among African Americans and, and Democrats. And, um, you know, I, I think the party's got to be able to speak to more people on a broader base. And I think the Democratic Party has to figure out also, it, successful politics is about addition and multiplication not subtraction and division. And I think both parties are kind of doing some subtracting and dividing and turning off those folks in the middle that you have to win. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, just final question. First of all, I'd be remiss if I didn't say our Dean at the College of Arts and Sciences, Max Paul Friedman, he's a wonderful man. We certainly would like to see Yumi back on campus. So as you know, a graduate of that school, we'd love to, to see her and he, I wanted to make sure they were very supportive of our, our efforts Absolutely, today. well, we appreciate it. As well. Um, last question. With all the challenges, with everything that's happening with COVID, finances, division during a national election, Governor, what are you most optimistic about? Well, you know, it's, it's sometimes in the middle of this global pandemic, this economic crisis with the, uh, the, the, the unrest and uh, over social justice issues across the country and, and all of the things that we're dealing with that we talked about, the angry politics, that I'm still hopeful about America's future. I'm, hope, I'm a big believer in the two-party system and I'm hopeful that we can find a better way to, to, to work together. And I'm really hopeful about the future because of the young people, many of whom hopefully are, are watching today. You know, I, I did, in addition to this one, I've, I've done some other Zoom things with a few other universities, including you know, University of Michigan, Harvard, um, and, and, and now with American. Uh, I, I think the fact that there are young people who really are interested in public service and who are pursuing their you know, academic studies in that and who are, care enough about America to get involved, I think that's probably the thing I'm most hopeful for. So I wanna thank all of, all of your students, particularly um, for, for listening in today and for, for the things that they're studying and working on, the issues and the policies. Uh, I think uh, I'm hopeful that our younger generation is gonna do a better job of those of us who are involved in it right now. Well, thank you so much, Governor. It's a great way to end. Please, everyone, this book, you have to buy it. I'm still standing by Governor Larry Hogan. It is an incredible book, and I really enjoyed hearing from you, getting to know you better, um, Governor. And I will say this, I feel so bad. I'm sorry to everybody we didn't get to all of your questions today, but um, on behalf of President Burwell, American University, the Science Institute, we'd like to have you back in person when the I students I would love to do it, Amy. Thank you very much. And we'll keep the conversation going. We um, wish you nothing but the best, uh, and we look forward to having you back on campus. And to everybody else, please sign up on Signs social media for our newsletter. We have great programming, and you will be able to see a recording of this if you miss part of it with the governor on our YouTube channel coming up. Governor, best of luck. And yep. please thank you so much, Amy. Heart. It was wonderful. I enjoyed talking with you and, 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 and thank you for the opportunity. I look forward to seeing you on campus. Excellent. We look forward to having you. Take care.